All right, welcome to our fun little Utah Avalanche Center roundtable of forecasters tonight. I'm Caitlin Hansen from the Utah Avalanche Center Board of Directors, and joining me tonight is Drew Hardesty, Craig Gordon, and Nikki Champion, all forecasters for the UAC. And we decided to come on here tonight and talk about some of the thoughts and discussions that the forecasters have been having and share their process with you as We've been dealing with the danger of the latest storm. So what we want to really talk about tonight is how the danger is going to be dropping soon, but there is still a lot of uncertainty. Um, one of the challenges with the snowpack is that it's very obvious and easy when the danger goes up, right? But there's no real clear formula or easy answer to tell us how quickly or slowly the danger goes down. So although we do think it's going to drop significantly very soon, we want to make sure to educate you and include you in this process, especially when there are deeply buried weak layers. So Drew, why don't you kick us off and let's first of all explain some terminology and maybe break down for us what are persistent weak layers and how do they actually form? When we talk about faceted grains within the snowpack or persistent weak layers, when we talk about persistent weak layers in the snowpack, we're talking about faceted grains generally or depth hoar or surface hoar. They form often in the early season at the base of the snowpack when the snowpack is still thin and we have these clear and cold nights. And instead of bonding together, they become weak and angular and cohesionless. With every subsequent storms, we see avalanches often failing down on these facets near the base of the snowpack. When they get big enough, they become depth hoar and they can plague us for weeks, even months into the season, even when the spring rolls around and we see wet climax avalanches down to the ground. So Nikki, maybe you can follow us up with what kind of avalanches we're seeing are accounting for most accidents and fatalities specifically this year, but even in general. Yeah, across the board, the most close calls, avalanches and accidents we've seen so far this year and notoriously we see are persistent weak layer issues. So both um, deep slab issues and just persistent slab issues. Combined, they make close to 70% of all avalanche fatalities fail on that layer. Um, there's a couple reasons, like Drew talked about, they, like their name insinuates, persist through the entire season or for a lot of the season often. Um, they can also allow people to travel out farther or not be quite as obvious as other um, instabilities like storm snow instabilities, wind drifted snow. They're not as much surface instabilities are not quite as visible when you're traveling. Therefore, they can kind of catch pe people off guard and create these really large, destructive and deadly avalanches. So Craig, we've got a graph here that we're gonna pull up that is an arc of storms and avi danger. When do we see most of our accidents on this arc and why is that? Yeah, so just as the storm is starting to get underway and kind of, you know, get its feet underneath itself, as the storm starts ramping up and those weak layers go through their initial rapid change, they're going to become cranky, you know, just like when people go through a rapid change. And so through that arc, as um, we get from a generally low danger into moderate, and kind of getting more into that considerable range, that's oftentimes when we see near misses, close calls, and unfortunately, avalanche accidents. You know, once we reach high, it's so in your face. People are pumping the brakes. You know, they're taking a step back. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, you're going down the freeway and you see cars off the road all over the place. What are you doing? You know, number one, either you're looking for the next exit or you're really starting to throttle it back a little bit. Now on the back end of that, you know, that's sort of the high danger on the back end of that, as the snowpack starts to adjust, you're not gonna see those big red flags that mother nature screams out to us. Natural avalanche activity, maybe shooting cracks or even loud um, thunderous whoops underneath your skis, your board, your sled, instead, the snowpack is becoming a little bit more comfortable in its own skin. It allows us to get into steeper, more avalanche prone terrain till we knock the legs out from underneath uh, the slab. And now the entire roof starts crashing down on top of us. So we talked about that graph that we were looking at just now. You actually sent over some photos from today up in the Uintas of a big slide up there. Can you relate that to the graph and kind of walk us through what we're seeing here, what we're looking for with that persistent weak layer? 
Yeah, absolutely. So both uh, Drew and, and Nikki totally nailed it and eloquently described what we're dealing with. We had early season snow. October looked awesome. November, man, it just uh, it decided to take a little bit of a hiatus. Winter did. Things got clear and cool. We described how that snow becomes faceted. It becomes weak. And then starting mid-December, right around the 15th, we got our first series of storms. Things really picked up, though, on the 23rd of December. I mean, it went out brilliantly with the New Year's Eve storm. But in between there, we saw strong winds, dense, heavy snow, inches and inches and inches of water. That's mostly in the central Wasatch and the areas um, in Logan, Manti Skyline, Western New Windows that were blessed with those big water amounts. Now, Places that had a weak sugary snowpack to begin with that maybe didn't quite get that water don't have as robust of a snowpack. Those basal layers are still very susceptible to these big rapid changes. Last night and yesterday, we saw just howling, howling winds along the ridge line, 60, 70, 80 miles an hour. We saw dense, heavy snow with lots of water in it. It overloaded these weak layers. And as a result, this big avalanche in Upper Weber Canyon is probably four football fields wide, maybe four or five feet deep, not particularly deep, but running about 1,200 vertical feet. And as you can see in these images, there's a lot of volume. So this isn't something that is just kind of uh, loose and wimpy and is just gonna gobble itself up. This thing is gonna pack a punch and it's also packing a lot of heat. These are the kinds of avalanches that make us feel really good when we're out on the snow because it'll feel strong under our skis, board, or sled. But again, all we need to do is find one weakness, and now the entire roof crashes down on top of us. Super tricky avalanche dragon in these areas that still have a weak, shallow, susceptible snowpack. Right. So we're kind of putting together the story, at least of our season right now. Drew, why are these persistent weak layers notoriously tricky, like Craig mentioned, to forecast in the days following a storm? What makes them like even more dangerous? Obviously, we see the magnitude of this slide. It's clear that it's dangerous. But can you walk us through why it's so tricky and what tools we have to assess them? Yeah, that's that's the key thing, Caitlin. You know, we call them persistent weak layers for a reason. It has to be matched with persistent patience, you know, as Craig alluded to, you know, all the signs are not in your face as much anymore. You know, we're not seeing avalanches every day. We're not hearing the audible collapses. We're not seeing the shooting cracks. And when that occurs, you know, the, the avalanches are becoming a little bit more comfortable, becoming a little bit more stubborn and tricky. And so we have to pull out our shovels to go and perform a bunch of snowpack tests. You know, we have the extended column test, um, that's one test that's going to give us some idea. Propagation saw test is another one. Um, and so we're going to be gauging um, the stability of the snow in the coming days to see how slowly things are going to be panning out for us or not. And once we start getting certain tests that make us feel more comfortable, um, then we're going to be moving into what we call a low probability, high consequence scenario, because there's quite a bit of variability out there in the snowpack. Um, again, if you hit a thinner snowpack area, area on a steep north facing slope, you might be able to um, fracture that into a pane of glass. And those spots are going to be much more isolated um, in the coming days. And so it, once again, we move into more of a moderate danger where it's low prob probability, high consequence. Once we get out about seven to 10 to two weeks, we generally call them dormant and we put them to bed, knowing that the, um, the weakness is still out there waiting for the next storms or significant thump to bring them alive again. So uh, Nikki, I'm gonna have you speak to this. I think a lot of times as backcountry skiers, we look to the UAC or to forecasters thinking like, just tell me if this is safe or not. When in fact, we want to have that education and go out, you know, do our route planning and everything for ourselves. Can you talk about uh, terrain management more specifically and what we need to be doing on our own? Obviously reading the forecast, but how are we likely to tri trigger these avalanches as we go out into the backcountry as we're trying to, you know, get a little more certainty as to the danger after these storms? 
Yeah, the nice thing about this persistent weak layer um, is that we know where it is. Uh, we know where it was before all that December storm snow came in, before we put, you know, close to two meters of snow on top of these weak faceted grains. So we know that you can find that weak faceted snow at the ground on those like west through north through east facing aspects. So that's sticking on like the very conservative side. We know that that's where it exists. And if you want to completely use terrain management and avoidance, you stay off those aspects. You stick to those southerly slopes. Like Drew kind of touched on, other ways or the other types of terrain that we want to manage is trying to avoid those areas that we know uh, probably has a thinner slab on top of those weak faceted slopes. So repeater slopes are going to be really suspect moving forward. They won't have that really deep slab. They're less likely to become dormant as quickly. So checking the forecast, reading the observations, seeing areas that are um, reporting to have huge slides that didn't go all the way to the ground and are still leaving that weak snow now with a less um, thick slab on top of it. Those are areas that you're likely to trigger. So all terrain management, just staying out of avalanche terrain is a really good way to manage terrain in general. You can go on those west through north through east facing aspects if you stick to slopes that are less steep than 30 degrees with nothing steep connected to or above you. So there's a couple tools they kind of vary from like being very conservative and staying away from those aspects in general to slope angle to then just starting to recognize where that faceted layer is more likely to become dormant and where you might still be able to trigger it moving forward. Thank you. Craig, finish us up here because everyone wants to get into the backcountry, right? We all want to be skiing. We want to stay on top of the snow and do it safely. How are these persistent weak layers healing? And what is the follow-up here for those, you know, waiting to see when can I get out there in the backcountry? Right, right. So the way these persistent weak layers heal, they're just like us in the desert and they love water and they love lots of it. They love that water weight because what that does is it helps to compress those weak layers and it helps those problematic grains to bond and to center and to get happy in their own skin. So the good news is that so many of our zones statewide got just clobbered recently with lots of snow. Let's think of snow not in terms of inches and feet of snow. Let's think of it in terms of water weight. And that water weight short term, what happens? The mountains get crazy, right? There's avalanches everywhere. We have avalanche warnings, red roses. But eventually, after all of that water rests on those weak layers, it helps to put them to bed. It helps them to get happy in their own skin, and we're starting to see indications of that. That's the good news where the snowpack is thick and robust. Some of the outlying zones or zones, as Nikki alluded to, maybe have a, a thinner slab. Also, Drew talked about this as well. Where we can affect that weak layer, those are the places that we really need to be on our A game. So we start stepping out into terrain that's a little bit uh, shallower in snowpack, you know, as things get tracked out or as they start to get used. Let's definitely use all of the tools available. And as we start moving forward, two great ways to manage this. One, give it a little bit of time, give it a little patience. We are going in the right direction. Or if you're looking to tag a big line, simply swing over to those aspects that don't have that old October, November snow generally south half of the compass. And right now you can get out and you can get after it. So plenty of exit strategies out there. Great. And of course, we're going to keep everybody up to date following the UAC. You guys are always out there on the snow, making sure we're staying as safe as possible. But do your homework, people, you know, get an education, know what you're doing out there, have the right gear and make sure you're watching the forecast and being safe. You guys, thanks so much. Thanks, Caitlin. Yeah, thank, thank you, Caitlin.